Good morning and welcome to the 2024 Stowen High School Hall of Fame induction. I am Kayla Tompanith, the National Honor Society President. On behalf of the staff and students, I would like to welcome Stowen School Committee, Superintendent Dr. Baeda, Assistant Superintendents Dr. Mr. Colantonio and Mr. Ford, State Representatives Galvin and Phillips, Stoughton faculty, staff, and students, and of course, our distinguished inductees and their honored guests. At this time, I'd like to introduce Stoughton High School Principal, Ms. Juliet Miller, for a few words of welcome. Thank you, Kayla. Good morning and welcome to Stoughton High School Hall of Fame for Extraordinary Achievement Induction Ceremony for 2024. For educators and administrators, there is nothing more rewarding than recognizing individuals who have gone on to do extraordinary things after the education they received here at Stoughton High School. Today, we welcome Judge David J. Breen, class of 1982, and Dr. Erin Flaherty, class of 2008, back to Stoughton High School in order to present them the honor of being inducted into the Hall of Fame. The Hall of Fame is an elite group of individuals who have done phenomenal work, achieved awards and recognitions, have given back to their communities, and had their beginnings here at Stoughton High School. I look forward to hearing from Judge Breen and Dr. Flaherty later on in the program as to what they might share with us, their words and stories of inspiration, and the connections they will make between their start at Stoughton High School and where they are today. We also welcome Judge Breen's and Dr. Flaherty's family and friends who have joined them here today. I am sure this is a proud moment for all of you as well. The Hall of Fame was established in 2004 through the efforts of Joanne McVoy Blundstrom in honor of her father Raymond and by Mr. Anthony L. Sano Jr., retired Stoughton superintendent. The point was to honor and recognize graduates of Stoughton High School who have achieved notable success in their chosen profession, either from a singular extraordinary accomplishment, career of exceptional achievement, or significant contribution to society. Those achievements may come from business, medicine, the humanities, the arts, the sciences, education, philanthropy, public service, or other similar fields. The Hall of Fame continues today as a joint effort between the Stoughton Public Schools and the Stoughton Historical Society. Mr. Sano was disappointed that he was unable to be here today. He called and he asked me to pass on a message from him to our inductees specifically. The Hall of Fame has always been a treasured moment for Mr. Sano, and though he cannot be here today, he wishes his sincerest congratulations to Judge David Breen and Dr. Aaron Flaherty for their remarkable pursuits and the honor their lives, work, and achievements bring to their larger community, their families and friends, but also to the alma mater, Stoughton High School. As I look out into the audience filled with the class of 2024 and 2025, I wonder what your futures will hold. Which of you might be on this stage 10 or more years from now receiving this very same honor? You each have gifts, talents, goals, and dreams. Now is the time to discover what they are, what inspires you, and what you aspire to accomplish or achieve. Listen carefully to the message of our honored inductees this morning. You may just find a connection between their stories and your own. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Miller. If able, please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance, which will be led by National Honor Society Vice President Alexandra Lada. Following the pledge, please remain standing for the singing of the national anthem, which will be sung by Emily DuPont, Amelia Lada, and Lila Silver. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Oh, 
say, can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming, whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight or the Thank you. At this time, I am pleased to welcome to the podium former and retired Stoughton Public School Superintendent, Dr. Margaret Rizzi. Good morning. It's lovely to see all of you. It's lovely to be back here with you. And it's really an honor to be a part of the Hall of Fame presentation. Uh, it, it always was a great deal of fun looking through the various accomplishments of so many people who have graduated from here and how well they've done and the contributions that have been made um, and the contributions that you all will be able to make. Um, I want you to remember that the world is full of wonders and amazing things that you can do. And I know that you will be doing amazing things with your life and with your time. Uh, and today we're welcoming um, Mr. Breen, who is a uh, judge in the Boston Municipal Court, was a law professor at Boston University and practiced law in various ways, including working for a number of attorney general's offices um, here and in other places as well. And he will tell you a little bit about his career and the kinds of things that he's been able to do. Uh, and I think that you'll find it um, both interesting and inspiring. Dr. Flaherty um, was in the graduating class the first year that I came here as a su assistant superintendent in 2008. Um, so I was on the stage the day that she crossed this stage. Uh, and has done amazing things since that time. Um, there are many things about her work that I am honestly gonna tell you I cannot pronounce. So I will let her pronounce them for you and um, explain to you some of the scientific terms, but um, many of the things that she has done um, have been um, about the connection between mental illness and the brain and the physiology of the brain and how those things connect together. Uh, so she's working in a field in which we certainly uh, need to know more and has made a great contribution to our knowing more about those things and can tell you about them. Um, so I hope that you are very proud of both of them as we are all very, very proud of you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rizzi. Please welcome National Honor Society Volunteer Coordinator, Joseph McSweeney, to the podium to introduce our first inductee. David J. Breen is a 1982 graduate of Stoughton High School, where he served as president of the student council and representative to the school committee, was a member of Honor Society, performed with the jazz and show choir, and appeared in several plays. 
He received his Bachelor of Arts from Georgetown University, his Juris Doctor from Boston University School of Law, and his Master in Public Ed Administration from Harvard Kennedy School of Government. Governor Deval Patrick swore David Breen in as an Associate Justice of the Boston Municipal Court on January 5, 2005. Judge Breen has presided over thousands of criminal and civil matters all in all eight courts that compromised the BMC since becoming a judge. In January of this year, Judge Breen was appointed as the first justice of the Roxbury Division of the BMC, which is the busiest trial courts in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Judge Breen was a clinical associate professor at BU Law for 12 years prior to becoming a judge. He also taught and trained graduate students in the BU Medical School's Biomedical Forensic Science Program. Some of his former students now appear before him as lawyers and CSI experts in court. Prior to becoming a professor, Judge Breen was a trial attorney both in New York City and in Massachusetts, where he investigated, prosecuted, and tried crimes ranging from robberies to murders and conducted wiretap investigations of local and international drug cartels. In 1991, Judge Breen was shot and nearly killed in a robbery at an ATM in Brooklyn, New York. The New York City Council later enacted comprehensive ATM safety laws as a result of the advocacy of Judge Breen and others. He has also been interviewed and featured in stories about his experiences in the New York Times, the Boston Globe, Dateline, NBC, Good Morning America, and various national and local news outlets. In 2017, Judge Breen appeared in the Academy Award nominated documentary, Strong Island, which centers on issues relating to the race and the 1992 shooting death of an African American man at the hands of a white garage worker in Long Island. Judge Breen lives in Brookline with his husband, Mike Harrington, and their two sons, Declan and Noah, and their dog, Flash. Please help me welcome Judge David Breen. Good morning, everybody. Let's try that again. Good morning, everybody. <laughs> Let's see if I can work this PowerPoint. All right. Uh, thank you, Joseph McSweeney, for the introduction. Um, I want to acknowledge and thank you, thank Superintendent Baeda and Principal Miller. Uh, also, particularly want to thank uh, Executive Assistant to the Superintendent, Kathy Lanzarado, who's been very helpful throughout this whole process. Um, thank you also to the members of the Stoughton Historical Society and the Selection Committee for the Stoughton High Academic Hall of Fame for Extraordinary Achievement. Uh, I am truly humbled and honored. Um, I also want to congratulate Dr. Flaherty from the class of 2008 for her induction. Um, I have spent the better part of the last 40 years uh, speaking in front of audiences and juries, so you'd think that this would be easy for me. Uh, I promise you, it is not. Uh, I was certainly happy to get the email uh, alerting me that I was uh, going to be honored with this, but I, was, I have been, quite frankly, at a loss as to what to say. So I turned to the young people in my family, my sons, my nieces, my nephews, for suggestions. Not very helpful. I got a text from one of my nephews saying, actually this was from my niece, who's a teacher, honestly, I don't know how much they will be listening anyway, Juniors and seniors are tough, so you can probably say whatever you want. Another nephew texted, throw some motivation in there. Something that would capture their attention would be good. Thanks, that's helpful. <clears throat> Another text said, be careful of what you say because some of them will Google you afterwards. <laughs> My son was more blunt, just don't embarrass us. So with that advice and knowing that I will likely fall short and possibly embarrass my family and friends, let me begin first by saying thank you to some folks. Um, so my mom and dad. Uh, Stoughton was a fairly rural place when my family moved here in the 1960s. I remember driving actually to Ames Pond for swim lessons when were, we would pass several farms with cows and horses. Uh, the town has certainly grown and changed since then, but one thing that is true about Stoughton, or was true then, and I think remains true today, is that it was a welcoming place for people coming here from other places. Like families from Portugal and Cape Verde and Haiti and so many other places, my parents migrated here um, from Boston to Stoughton for many of the same reasons. An education, a place to call home, 
and to provide more and better opportunities for their family. And I'm certainly glad and thankful that they did that. Uh, it was not always easy for them, in particular for my mom after my dad died, leaving uh, four sons for her to raise alone. But I can tell you that I've never had a bigger cheerleader and champion than Elaine Breen. Uh, I would not literally be on this stage if it were not for my mom, uh, not just because she gave birth to me, but also because apparently she was the one who nominated me for this. <laughs> so thank you, Mom. <sighs> I have uh, three brothers, uh, two of whom are here today. Um, They're all proud graduates of both the Gibbons School and the junior high and the Stoughton High. Um, here's a picture of us as kids looking more like a boy band. Uh, I mostly did student government and music and theater in high school, but my brothers were the athletes in the family. My older brother Chuck was a varsity wrestler and football player, and Scott and Kevin were both captains of their football teams, and all have become successful adults and fathers. Uh, again, Kevin and Scott are here. Kevin, the baby of the family, has questioned the wisdom of whether the correct Breen was chosen for this honor today. Uh, apparently, he wants a recount. Uh, I am thankful for my brothers, even when they give me a hard time, which is often. Um, I also need to thank uh, my husband, Mike Harrington, um, my husband and best friend. Uh, we've been together for almost 24 years and legally married for about 10. Uh, a lot of, we have had a lot of adventures together, both before and after kids. So thank you, Mike, for putting up with me and for being a great father and our two boys, to our two boys. Speaking of our two boys, uh, Declan and Noah. Uh, they keep me on my toes, and they also help expand my vocabulary. They've introduced me to such words as sus and riz. I'm still not sure how I feel about being called bruh, uh, but I do know that it's a compliment when they say that dinner was bussin'. Um, I am proud to be their father, and they both make me appreciate that dad is the best title that I could possibly have, no cap. So, uh, my family would not be complete or anywhere near as interesting without my sisters-in-law and brother-in-law and nieces and nephews. Somehow my brothers each managed to find a perfect partner for them who could put up with them and have become great mothers to their kids and aunts to my, ki uh, to my kids. And I'm grateful for my sisters-in-law, my brother-in-law, and my nieces and nephews. Uh, I have uh, an extraordinary group of friends from growing up here in Stoughton. Uh, we have been there for each other in so many different ways, and we continue to make each other laugh and occasionally cringe, and I'm grateful for the friendship. Um, uh, we uh, have changed perhaps over the years, uh, we've gone through lots of different changes. I'm not just talking about the clothes and the hairstyle, um, and I know our spouses and family members get sick of us telling the same stories over and over again of our glory days. Uh, and singing songs from the 80s and whatnot, but I would have it no other way, and I thank you all for being here today. So, uh, this is a slide from Pippin, which was a show that we did in 1980. Pippin is a musical that is loosely based on the life and times of Prince Pippin, the son of the medieval king Charlemagne. It's about Pippin's quest for fame, fortune, and fulfillment, and there is a song in the show called Extraordinary. I've been thinking a lot about that song because of the title of today's event. He sings, I won't, he sings, uh, patching the roof and pitching the hay is not my idea of a perfect day. When you're extraordinary, you have to do extraordinary things. The idea is that Pippin thinks that he has to always be in the spotlight and be doing something glamorous and special and to have, in order to have a meaningful life. Spoiler alert, he's wrong, but we'll get back to that. But what does it mean to be extraordinary? Extraordinary is defined as very unusual, special, or unexpected, according to the Oxford Dictionary. Now, I suppose some might say, I know my brothers would say that I am unusual, but I don't always feel all that special. Um, perhaps there are some things in my life since Stoughton High that have been unusual and unexpected, if not extraordinary. I never imagined that I was going to end up being a judge when I sat in the seats of the auditorium of the high school, the old high school. Uh, but I'm not the first judge associated with Stoughton. And fun fact, William Stoughton, who was, was once the chief justice of a trial court here in Massachusetts. Unfortunately, he was the chief justice of the Salem witch trial court. And worse, um, he was the only judge um, 
of the Salem witch trials who never apologized or repented for sending innocent women and men to death. I'm hoping not to follow in his footsteps. Um, I also have to confess that I feel awkward that somehow my getting shot somehow is seen as extraordinary. Um, rather than focus on what happened to me, I like to focus on what I did after that incident. Um, I learned through that process that ATMs make a lot of money for banks. Um, ATMs don't take sick leave, they don't take vacation leave, um, but they take in a lot of money for the banking industry. Um, they often don't have security. I found out that when I was shot, the bank lobby that I was in had no security camera. I also found out that sometimes bank would put up, banks would put up fake dummy cameras. Uh, I was proud to work with the city of New York and to change the laws there to make at least there the ATMs a little bit safer. I was also proud to be involved in the documentary that was mentioned, Strong Island, which to be clear is not about me, it's about William Ford uh, and his experience of him coming to try to rescue me after I was shot and then him being shot about a year later uh, in a dispute with a white garage owner. He was essentially the Trayvon Martin before Trayvon Martin. Um, I was proud to be part of that experience and to tell that story. Um, I don't get any residuals or anything, so feel free to look at it, look at, it at Netflix. Um, but it was a historical um, piece at the time when it was no nominated for an Academy Award, uh, not just for the story, but also because the filmmaker was the first uh, openly trans male filmmaker to be uh, so honored. So that was kind of cool. Um, Having said that, I don't recommend getting shot to get yourself into a movie. Uh, much of my life since Stoughton High and before becoming a judge was spent as an advocate, teacher, and a community activist. Um, I think my family was more than a little surprised when after law school I turned down a much higher paying job in a law firm to move to New York and become a prosecutor. Um, it was probably one of the hardest jobs I ever had, but I loved it. Um, I felt like I was trying to make a difference um, and serving the public. I also loved standing up and advocating for victims of crime in court, but I also liked and loved dismissing cases where the defendants were wrongly or improperly accused of certain crimes. Now, despite some people finding it fashionable these days to bash government workers and public employees, I do recommend a career in being a service to others. Uh, while most of my work as an advocate happened in the courtroom, sometimes I had to advocate for myself and my friends in other ways. Uh, despite never having biked for more than the distance from my house to the town spa, I found myself fundraising across the state of Alaska, uh, doing a fundraising bike ride, um, 500 miles, and then up and down the East Coast to raise money for HIV and AIDS research and treatment. Uh, I'd like to think it's another example of trying to be of service for others. You don't have to necessarily be elected or appointed to a position to help serve your community. Um, I do have to tell you that it's extraordinary to me that Stoughton High is honoring someone who happens to be openly gay. Um, when I was 17 year old, there were very, very few openly gay people anywhere. Uh, there were certainly no openly gay teachers or GSAs at Stoughton High. There were no flags or stickers on classroom doors letting kids know that it was okay to be different. In fact, uh, kids who were involved in music or theater were often teased and called names when I was a student. Um, it may seem crazy to people sitting in the audi audience right now, but in the 1980s, in some states, you could be arrested in your own home simply for being in a gay relationship. And you could be fired in every state in this country for being gay. Uh, politicians back then demonized gay people, and we had a president at that time who wouldn't say the word AIDS out loud uh, while thousands of people were being infected by the HIV virus. That's the world that we lived in when I was graduating from high school. So I had a choice at that point of either playing it safe and staying in the closet and being miserable or fighting for equality, I decided to fight. Uh, the plaque today uh, from my induction lists me as an LGBT leader. That was certainly not anything I planned I was honestly just trying to lead an honest and authentic life. Um, and it turned out when Governor Patrick appointed me to the Boston Municipal Court, I became only the second openly gay man to have been appointed in the court's 200 year history. Now, I recognize that my being gay is not necessarily an extraordinary achievement in and of itself, but I do think it counts as progress that my being gay is not that big of a deal anymore for folks. Um, but there's more work to do especially for trans kids who, like gay people before 
uh, are being demonized by politicians simply for who they are. And so for any of you who identify as part of the LGBTQ plus community, please know that you are not alone and things do get better. I told you a few minutes ago that when I uh, turned to the young people in my family for suggestions, they, uh, let me go back up for a second, hold on. Uh, that there was, there was one text I received from my niece Morgan that I actually thought was helpful. And I noticed that she's the only one I've named because it was the only helpful text I got. <laughs> she wrote, I talk about how their lives are just beginning and opportunities and success can arise no matter what path they choose. That is so true. Um, your lives are just beginning and success, no matter how you define it, can come in many different ways. But the important thing is that you get to decide what it is that makes you successful. When you get to be my age, you realize that you have fewer years ahead of you than behind you. You also start to think about your life and things that are important. You also realize that success is not about money or fame or titles. It's about family, friends, relationships, and experiences. Sometimes extraordinary success can be found in doing the ordinary things like patching the roof and pitching the hay. Um, I've also been thinking about the 17 year old who sat in the seats that you're sitting in. I mean, not literally, because we had really ugly seats. Um, but how, how unexpectedly my life has unfolded over the past 40 years. So what advice would I give to the 17 year old me who was sitting in the audience? First of all, put on a shirt um, uh, and also be grateful that cell phones and social media did not exist when I was in college so that stupid things that I did are not forever on the internet. Um, this is the, actually the picture of the auditorium that we did sit in. Um, I wish someone had told me when I was 17 that I would fail. Um, like a lot, I would fail. Um, I did poorly in some classes. I literally did fail a class in college. Uh, I did not get accepted to some schools that I wanted to go to. I did not get what I thought was going to be my dream job. Um, and like many other folks, I had some losses that seemed insurmountable. My dad, my grandmothers, my mother-in-law, friends, too many friends in the prime of their life. But here's the thing that I wish I had known when I was 17. Failures and losses as painful as they can be, make one more resilient and also prepare oneself for future challenges. Um, I also wish someone had told me that it's okay to be afraid sometimes. Fear is a natural protection. Uh, primitive mankind learned to be afraid of predator animals. So a healthy sense of fear is good. It keeps us safe. When it's not healthy though, is when fear becomes so overwhelming that it prevents us or you some people are afraid of change. Uh, I mean, change is hard. It's easy to just stay the course, do the same thing over and over again, live in the same place, stay at the same job, hide your truth self, true self from your family and friends, all because you're afraid. I wish someone had really impressed upon me when I was 17 that really the only way to thrive and grow though, and to be happy, is to embrace and confront your fears and work through them. Um, when I was 17, I think, I also thought there'd be a direct path from high school to college to success. Uh, one of the things that I realize now is that there really is no direct path to success. And I worked a lot of different jobs, minimum wage jobs and otherwise along the way. Um, and they certainly did not feel extraordinary at the time, but I actually learned some things about myself and other people from every single job I ever had. Uh, from high school and into law school, I worked nights and weekends at Bob's Food Mart, uh, just up the road from here where I went from being a stock boy to a manager. And I learned from Mr. DiMatteo, I could never call him Bob, it was always Mr. DiMatteo, how to treat everyone with respect and appreciation and dignity. I also learned from being a waiter, um, how to work with the public. I had a lot of jobs where I had to wear uniforms or jeans and a t-shirt ranging from McDonald's to Bay State Gas Company, as a meter reader, as a security guard, a mailroom clerk in the United States Capitol. And I worked, I worked in places where I had to wear a suit like the State House here in Massachusetts, at law firms, and also at the US Capitol where I was an intern. I was the same person whether I wore a uniform or where I wore a suit, but I was treated differently. I was invisible when I was pushing mail carts around the Capitol building in my jeans and a t-shirt. But if I wore a suit and I had my ID badge, people would nod and say hello. It was a good lesson for me not to judge people by their clothing Having said that, it also never hurts to look the best that you can, although it would have been weird to wear a three-piece suit at McDonald's. Uh, 
When I was 17, things also seemed black and white. I had my religious and political be beliefs. And while I recognized that other people had different beliefs, they were wrong. I said I loved to debate, but I, what I really loved was to get my opinions out there. Um, there was not a whole lot of listening going on. And even as a young prosecutor, I sometimes saw things in categories of right and wrong. The older I've gotten, I realized that life is not always black and white, it's gray. As a prosecutor, I realized that truth is not easy to know or to see right away. Uh, there is oftentimes, there was what the victim told you what happened, there was what the defendant or the defense attorney told you what happened, there's what the police officer told you what happened, but the truth sometimes was parsed out of all those different parts of what was told. As I've gotten older, I also have come to appreciate that people whom I love and respect may have very different views about many different topics, and that's okay. We can agree to disagree. I also learned that you rarely get others to agree with you by yelling or louder or making personal attacks on them. We live in a very divided world right now. People are angry. Uh, we see it in our politics every day. I see it in the courts sometimes. Some people think that in order to succeed, you have to win at all costs or belittle someone else. Some people think that the only way to, success, the only way to succeed is to make a lot of money and show off what you have. Greed is good. That was the mantra of the movie Wall Street and epitomized the 1980s and 90s and it still continues for some people today. I don't agree with that. I think that you can lead with love and grace and still succeed. I also think that you can succeed um, by being of service to others. Whether you are religious or not, um, you may have heard the phrase, the meek, the meek shall inherit the earth from the New Testament. Uh, meek is an interesting word. It sounds like weak, but that's not what it means at all. At all. Uh, Bob DiMatteo is here today, uh, the son of Bob's food mart, uh, Mr. DiMatteo. He's my friend, former employer, um, and he actually took, talked me through this once uh, many, many years ago, uh, that meek actually means gentle. Uh, it can also mean kindness. So in addition to love and grace, it's important to have patience and kindness. Be meek. Uh, treat people gently when you can. I know that I have to try to remember to, to do that every day in court. I'm not sure that there's anything extraordinary. I'm not sure that there is anything extraordinary about me, but I would like to think that I'm a better person and a better judge because of the start I got here in Stoughton and through all of my experiences since then. Um, certainly working in so many judges, sorry, sorry, working in so many jobs and interacting with diverse people from all walks of life helped prepare me for this role. Um, I may not get it right all the time, but unlike Judge Stoughton, I am willing to admit when I get it wrong. So I'm going to return back to Pippin. Um, he goes off in the play and fights in a war and he schemes to take over the kingdom, of, uh, the kingdom from his father, King Charlemagne, and he tries to find personal glory. But eventually, he returns home to his girlfriend and steps up and becomes a loving father to her son. Pippin comes to realize, I think, what, and I hope, that what we all realize eventually, sometimes it is in the day-to-day -day living that makes us content and happy. And success means nothing if you don't have someone with whom to share it. And so, I leave you with one last piece of unsol unsolicited advice. Find someone who loves you for who you are. Find someone with whom you can laugh and cry, with whom you can patch the roof and pitch the hay. That truly is, I think, the definition of being extraordinary. Thank you. Thank you, Judge Breen, for your words, which will certainly inspire me and my classmates. It is my pleasure to introduce National Honor Society Volunteer Coordinator Kyle Grant to introduce our second inductee. Dr. Erin Flaherty graduated from Stowen High School in 2008. She went on to complete a bachelor's and master's of science in biology and biotechnology at Worcester Polytechnic Institute. In 2019, Erin received her PhD in neuroscience from the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. 
During her PhD, she studied how genetic mutations found in individuals with schizophrenia affects neuron development and function in the brain, and her findings were published in Nurture Genetics. Erin is now completing her postdoctoral fellowship in Dr. Tom Maniatis' lab at Columbia University, where she, where she studies how neurons form circuits during development. Please help me welcome Dr. Flaherty. Hi, everyone. Good morning. Uh, first, I want to thank Kyle for the really nice introduction and start by thanking uh, the superintendent, principal, historical society, and nominating committee for selecting me to talk with you all today and inducting me into this great group and everybody else who has made this day possible. It's really nice to be back here in Stoughton. My family actually lived right across the street from here for many years, and even though I went to the old high school, I got to watch this new building get formed over the last few years, um, and it's really beautiful inside, so you guys are all very lucky to be here. I also want to thank my family, without any of whom I wouldn't be here today. They are really the most important things in my life, and that's one lesson that I'd like to share with you guys today is that finding people who support you and that you can really rely upon in your life, whether it's family, friends, or anyone else, is really what's important. It brings you such fulfillment when you have these people who, as you go through your trials and your tribulations, you can uh, talk to them, get advice, get feedback, and make sure that you have someone who understands what you're going through and can help you through any challenging times. I'll first start by thanking my parents, uh, Tom and Eileen, who are both here today. The Flaherty family journey at Stoughton High School started in 1975 when my dad, Tom, graduated from Stoughton High. And throughout my time in Stoughton and in the years since, my uh, parents have always been incredibly supportive. They've constantly sacrificed their own time, taking me and my three sisters to sporting events, after school activities, friends' houses, summer camps, and wherever else we needed a ride to get to. And it's uh, really amazing watching them always put all of us first. And they were incredible role models, instilling in us values of respect and hard work. And these are things that I am trying to instill in my daughter today. Along with my parents, I want to acknowledge my three sisters, Colleen, Megan, and Shannon, who all took time off to be here today for the ceremony, and they really continue to be my biggest cheerleaders in life. All of us are Stoughton High School graduates, but as some of the teachers at Stoughton High here may tell you, we all had our unique journey through the high school. My sisters have each begun their own incredible careers. Colleen and Megan work in education in Rhode Island, and Shannon has begun an accounting career. And even though all of them are still based here in Massachusetts, and I've now moved down to New York City, we're closer than ever now, and I'm so proud of all of the accomplishments that they've um, been able to um, accomplish this far. And sisters are really the friends that you can always count on, and so I'm so lucky to have all three of them in my life. And then finally, I'd like to thank my husband, Joe, who couldn't be here today as he's taking care of our daughter back in New York. And I met Joe while I was in college at Worcester Polytechnic Institute, and he's always supported me through all of the journey of my career, starting at our graduation from uh, college together in 2012, and then throughout the many graduations that have happened since then. And these close relationships, as I said, are so important as you journey from high school and begin your careers and begin stepping into your adult lives. Having people you can trust, provide support through difficult times, hear you out when you need to vent about a problem, or give you advice and comfort really makes that huge difference. And so I thought today I would share with you all just the path that has brought me here and maybe a couple of things that I've learned along the way. And it really all did start here in Stoughton. I moved to Stoughton in sixth grade, and I can still remember and feel that anticipation on the first day of middle school about how was I gonna make any new friends, um, and what was that going to be like? But luckily, I was able to find a really great group of ambitious and caring friends. And as you can see from some of the photos that I've shared here today from our middle school Washington DC trip, junior prom, and all of the different senior week events that you guys are all going to be experiencing in the next few months or years, 
you should really just enjoy your time while you're here. It's an incredible experience. You get to have so much fun. Um, and I look back with really fond memories of this time during my life. So I thought I first briefly talk about the career path for, um, that I've taken in scientific research. And as you heard in my introduction, I'm currently a postdoctoral research scientist. And it was really during my time in Stoughton High School that my interest in science began. I enjoyed taking classes, uh, science classes with Mr. Kelleher and Mr. Silva, who were teachers here when I was here. And I also played sports while at Stoughton High. I was a pitcher for the softball team. And our softball coach, Janet Sullivan, who was also a science teacher here at Stoughton High, always took an interest in how all of the students' classes were going, and she really encouraged me to continue to pursue my interest in science as I moved on to college. And so I was really fascinated with human biology, and I really wanted to know how changes inside the cell could lead to disease. And so when I applied to college, I knew I wanted to study science. But as you may notice from the start of my talk, I'm also extremely close with my family, and it's so important to me, so I wanted to apply to colleges that were close to home so that I could come back and visit whenever I wanted to. And so I ended up at Worcester Polytechnic Institute, or WPI, on a full scholarship, which was very lucky because that was an important consideration in our decision at the time. And this actually turned out to be an excellent opportunity because WPI allowed me to also play softball while I was there, which brought me a lot of joy, and all the friends from my softball team are still my closest friends today. So I would encourage all of you to keep doing the things that you love doing here in high school, in college. It's really a great way to meet people who have similar interests uh, that you do. So academically, WPI is known as an engineering school, and at the time, I was interested in possibly pursuing biomedical engineering. That sounded really cool to me. Um, however, in college, I learned one valuable lesson that I'll share. It's okay to change what you're doing and try something new. Just because you made a choice doesn't mean you have to keep continuing down that road. I quickly realized in my freshman year classes that engineering was not for me. I did not want to study fluid dynamics or do complicated math equations all day. I wanted to learn about science, and so I ch chose to then switch over to a strictly biology degree and thought about becoming a doctor. In line with my goal of becoming a doctor, during my senior year, I worked uh, in an emergency room trying to enroll pa patients in a clinical study. And while being a, med a medical doctor always sounded like it was the right path, people really supported you when you told them you wanted to be a doctor, it was, uh, I quickly realized that this wasn't exactly right for me. Where my curiosity really lied when I was in the emergency room was, how did these people actually get here in the first place? How do they develop disease? How can it be prevented? And can we come up with better treatments for them? And so what I learned during this time was that this isn't actually the role of a doctor. This is usually the role of a research scientist, trying to figure out how these diseases might arise and how the med medicines that doctors prescribe to people with them actually get made. And so I chose to stay at WPI for two more years uh, and learn a little bit more about scientific research. Specifically, the brain always interested me because it's such a mystery. And so I joined the lab of a Dr. Elizabeth Ryder at WPI. And I chose her lab because I really enjoyed one of her undergraduate courses. She seemed really approachable. And so it seemed like a good fit. And her lab studied how neurons in, in the brain migrate to their final position. So when we all develop, we need to form neural connections. And she used a tiny little worm called a C. elegans, which you can see on the slide up here, to try to understand this process. And so this was another lesson that I've learned and has kept with me during my uh, career trajectory, is that finding a good mentor is actually more important than finding the exact right question that you want to pursue. Dr. Ryder was extremely patient. I had never done any research before, and she really supported me as I learned a ton of new things. And she gave me a lot of advice on how to continue my career in research. I've never met someone who had become a scientific researcher as a profession, and I didn't really know what are the steps that you need to take. And so she encouraged me during my master's degree to actually go out and get a PhD, as that's really the best way if you want to lead and um, do new research. And so when I finished my master's, I knew that I was going to apply for PhDs, but 
I really wanted to get back to that human biology. I was kind of sick of these little worms by then. And so I applied um, to PhD programs and chose to do my PhD at Mount Sinai, which is, an is a research hospital that's connected to a regular inpatient hospital. And their research is extremely focused on how to find cures for different diseases. And so at Mount Sinai, this was a huge decision, choosing to move away from Massachusetts. I had chosen a college to stay close to home, and now I'm sort of like going out into New York City. But it ended up being one of the best decisions that I've ever made. And not because just about how much I learned during my time at my PhD, but also how much you grow as a person when you sort of step out on your own and take on a new challenge. And so at W, at uh, Mount Sinai, I chose again a lab based on who was the mentor. And so I chose Kristen Brennan. She was a young, new professor, full of excitement and energy, and this was contagious. And she really gave off these vibes that anything was possible. She was an extreme sports athlete and really took that into the lab. And so I really wanted to work under her. And our lab studied schizophrenia, which affects about 1% of the global population. And it causes people to hallucinate or cause delusions. And a lot of times, this is how it's depicted in popular culture and in movies. But it actually also has a lot of other symptoms that people don't know as much about, like depression and cognitive impairments that really affects um, people's lives more significantly. And so we studied schizophrenia by obtaining skin biopsies from patients who were diagnosed with schizophrenia or control. So this is just a tiny skin sample off of your arm. And what we can do with those skin cells is turn them into stem cells. And stem cells are amazing because they can convert into any cell of the human body. And because we're interested in the brain, we turned these stem cells into neurons. And so we had these neurons that were from patients diagnosed with disease, as well as neurons from control individuals. And our big question in our lab was, what's going on in the neurons of the patients? And can we use that information to help treatment? And so for my project, um, what we discovered was that individuals who had a specific genetic mutation, they created a mutant protein inside of their bodies that was actually causing their neurons to fire less actively than in the controls. And so this was important for how their brain was functioning. And what's incredibly exciting about some of the work that we did there is that now follow-up studies are getting done to create a drug that destroys that mutant protein. And soon we'll hopefully know whether that drug can actually help these individuals with some of their symptoms, help manage those uh, hallucinations, and maybe some of the cognitive symptoms too. And so this was a really exciting and fascinating project. And so from this experience, I knew I wanted to start my own research lab. I want to become a professor and come up with questions similar to what I just told you about. However, to become an academic professor, one thing that you may not know is that you actually can't just get a PhD and then apply for jobs. We have a internship period called a postdoctoral fellowship where you really are supposed to learn the ropes of how to do this. And so um, I decided to move to Columbia University where I'm now a postdoc and studying similar questions of how the neurons can integrate and how mutations in people who have either neurodevelopmental disorders such as autism spectrum disorder or neuropsychiatric disorders disorders like schizophrenia and bipolar disorders may have affected neurodevelopment and how can we fix this process. And so I'll share one final thing that I learned through my scientific journey, which is to really find something that motivates you. As I hope you can see, I find the world of science and neuron biology extremely fascinating. It's a field where new discoveries can really lead to significant changes in people's lives. When they're diagnosed with these disorders, they can often feel helpless, and these treat types of new treatments could uh, find potential cures or even just help their daily lives improve. The, the treatments that are currently offered for the types of conditions that we study often may be useful for some people, but definitely not all, and may only affect some symptoms, but definitely not all. And so the, for me, the idea of improving the quality of life is extremely motivating for the work that I'm doing today, and also the work that I hope to do in the future. And as I sat here in your seat um, at Stoughton High School, I had no idea that this was my career path. I think as you might appreciate, there was a lot of winding roads. Science is a big place, and so finding your place in it um, was a little bit more of a journey than I would have expected. But I relied on my support system of family and friends, 
I chose a path that kept me doing things that I enjoyed instead of trying to keep on the current course. And I chose a career that kept me motivated to keep pushing and gives me hope to keep pushing in the future. And so I hope all of you sitting here today will find these things as you move on from, to Stoughton High School from your own careers um, and um, continue into your adult lives. I've really enjoyed coming back to Stoughton today and I just wanna thank all of you again for uh, hearing what I had to say today and hopefully sharing a few lessons that I've learned along the way. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Flaherty. I am certain your words will motivate and encourage our students to strive for excellence. At this time, I'd like to call on stage State Representative Edward Phillips for a presentation of citations. We'd also like to welcome Senator Timulty to the stage for citations as well. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is State Representative Ted Phillips. I'm joined by State Representative Bill Galvin, State Senator Walter Timothy. Um, Judge Breen, Dr. Flaherty, uh, it is a privilege to be here with you this morning uh, in order to celebrate your incredible achievements and accomplishments uh, and to recognize you for the inspiration that you are, not just to uh, the Stoughton High School students that are sitting here today, but also to your fellow alumni and the greater Stoughton community at large. Uh, and so in order to recognize that in our own special way, uh, we have some citations from the House and the Senate. Um, they read very much similarly, so I'm just gonna read one of them, uh, which is just, be it hereby known to all that the Massachusetts House of Representatives offers its sincerest congratulations to both the Honorable David J. Breen and the Honorable Dr. Aaron K. Flaherty, PhD, in recognition of being inducted into the Stoughton Public Schools and the Stoughton Historical Society's Academic Hall of Fame as a member of Stoughton High School's Class of 2008, Class of 1982, for your outstanding achievements in your career. Uh, the entire membership extends its very best wishes and expresses the hope for future good fortune and continued success in all endeavors. It's given this 15th day of March, 2024 at the State House, Boston, Massachusetts. The House citations are signed by Speaker of the House, Ron Mariano, State Representative William C. Galvin, and State Representative Edward R. Phillips. Congratulations both. Thank you, good morning. Uh, thank you very much for this privilege of being here to honor our two outstanding graduates, Judge Breen, class of 82, and Dr. Flaherty, class of 2008. Uh, you are both incredible role models for the students here and not just for your academic careers, but the way you've led your lives ever since. You've been champions in so many different ways for all of us, so congratulations to each and every one of you. Uh, you know, Judge Breen, when I was looking at your educational background as a Georgetown University graduate, I thought to myself less seriously that you witnessed some great basketball at Georgetown University in the 80s. And uh, Dr. Flaherty, um, I heard somebody say today from the dais that you deal with words that I can't even pronounce. And uh, you've gone to, of course, attended one of the finest ed engineering schools in the entire world. So to congratulations to you both. We have citations from the State Senate, which are official documents, as they are in the House of Representatives, and they read as follows. Commonwealth of Massachusetts State Senate, official citation, be it known that the Massachusetts State Senate hereby extends its congratulations to Dr. Aaron K. Flaherty and Judge Breen in recognition of your notable accomplishments and gains as an inductee of the 30th Academic Hall of Fame for extraordinary achievement here at Stoughton High School. And be it further known that the Massachusetts State Senate extends its best wishes for continued success that this citation be duly signed by the President of the State Senate and a copy thereof attested to by the Clerk of the Senate. It has been signed, Judge Breen and Dr. Flaherty, by our Senate President, Senator Karen E. Spilka. Our clerk has attested to it, Michael Hurley, and offered by myself, one very proud State Senator. Uh, congratulations to you all, and I must say, uh, Judge Breen, knowing your brother Scott, I can tell that uh, being around the Breen boys, it's not for the meek. It's not for the meek. It's not for the meek. Uh, congratulations to you, Mrs. Breen, and to you, Dr. Flaherty, congratulations to your parents. Thank you very much.
Congratulations. Yeah. Thank you, representatives and senators. Please welcome Stoughton Superintendent Dr. Joseph Bayeda to the podium for a few closing remarks. Good morning, bon dia, uh, Judge Breen, Dr. Flaherty, guests, colleagues, and all of the students that are here um, this morning. Um, thank you for the motivational comments that both of you made this morning. Hard work, determination, being focused are all part of your accomplishments. As students who lived in this small suburban community, you were provided, I believe, with an exceptional public school education. The great Brazilian soccer player Paley once said, success is no accident. It, it is hard work, perseverance, learning, studying, sacrifice, and most of all, love of what you are doing or learning to do. Success is not an accident, and yes, it does take and include a small amount of luck, but this is also defined by a sense of community. The old saying, it takes a village, is evident in all of the inductees that share in the Hall of Fame. Uniquely, they have each reminded us of what it takes to be the best of the best. So this morning as I close this Hall of Fame induction ceremony, and in recognizing these two outstanding alumni, I leave you, the students, with a challenge. Dream big, work hard, be ready for the challenge that life brings. In the end, know that your story can also one day be in the Hall of Fame. Once a night, always a night, have a great remainder of the day. Thank you. I'd like to thank you all for coming today to recognize the achievements of Judge David Breen and Dr. Aaron Flaherty, as they have been inducted into our Hall of Fame of Extraordinary Achievement. Plaques containing the Hall of Fame inductees are located by the main entrance of the high school. Congratulations to Judge David Breen and Dr. Aaron Flaherty for their many achievements. This concludes our ceremony. Please remain seated for further instructions. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming today.